to introduce the topic, really introduce the work that I've done on this subject of the rights of parents. So when I was in Mauritania studying, and this was back in um, 99 or 2000, one of my shiuch, Murabat Muhammad Al-Amin, whose his laqab is Hadda um, he, he he encouraged me to study some of the books of Sheikh Muhammad Mouloud. Sheikh Muhammad Mouloud was a scholar in West Africa who lived about 150 years ago, and he took it upon himself to write a very, very interesting curriculum, a, very, a series of textbooks. So he basically looked at what the educational system there in, in Mauritania, the, the Mahdara system, uh, which there was no buildings, it was basically Ulama, men and women who would teach wherever they are, under a tree, on the top of, on the back of a camel. Uh, one of the scholars even said, "Qad ittakhadna zuhur al-Isi madrasatan fiha nubayyinu din Allahi tabiyana." We have taken the backs of camels as our madrasa, and through them we we clarify the deen of the, uh, of Allah to the people. So they would teach wherever they were, um, and it's a it's a very very extensive um, educational system. He came along and he looked at it and he noticed gaps, and he started writing textbooks to fill those gaps. So the first book that I was advised to study by one of my shaykh was Maharam al-Lisan, The Prohibitions of the Tongue, which I'm, I'm assuming it has some place in the, the yeah. curriculum here. Um, and I studied it during Ramadan, this was in 99, and it had a profound effect on my life, like fasting in the Mahdara, memorizing Quran at the time, uh, taking a break from fiqh to study Quran, and then studying his book had a profound effect on me. And then after that, I just studied book after book of his books, and I found uh, that that it that it 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 rounded out my educational experience in the Mahdara. And as I spoke to other people that studied the series of, of Sheikh Muhammad Mulud, they all said the same things: that 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 if you study all of the ulum al-Sharia, the, the Sharia sciences, without his books, there's this like raspiness or unfinished element uh, to it, and his books uh, really round it out. And what I found is that what he did is that he basically sifted through all of these sources, the Quran and the Hadith and the, the commentaries of those and the books of fiqh, and then put it together and to, to fill these gaps. So for example, the prohibitions of the tongue, he said everybody's studying all of this extensive fiqh knowledge, but they don't know about their tongue. He said that's more important and that's on a daily basis. So he wrote that book. Uh, in fact, when people are about to get married and sometimes they come to me and they say, I'd like to study the fiqh of marriage. I said, actually study Maharam al-Lisan. Because the, the fiqh of marriage is easy. It's the tongue that you have to be thinking about and the purification of the heart, which he has a book on. One of his books is Birr al-Waridain. So I, I, I studied the book. It had a profound effect on me. I immediately went to translate it to come back because part of ilm is, the zakat of ilm is that once you learn, you want to give, you have to give out a portion of it. Um, and speaking of the fountains, one of Murabat Haddamin told me, he said, fountain or wells, if you don't continuously draw water from the well, it'll dry up. So you have to give out to keep the, 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 the water of the well. And he said knowledge is like that as well. So you have to constantly give out to keep, to keep it fresh, to keep it there and also to keep it from stagnating. So I translated it, I began teaching it, and subhanAllah, even just with a basic translation of the, the poem, it's about a 120 line poem, there was amazing effects. Um, I would present it in about two hours. I would go through the whole thing very quickly. One time in San Diego, there was a brother, he was just, he was walking by as I was going over the book, and he just, he kind of, it caught his ear, something caught his ear, so he stood at the door, and he leaned up at the door, and he started listening, and he leaned at the door for two hours, listening to, as I went through this, the, this book, this is the translation plus commentary, but at the time it was just the translation. Afterwards, he came up to me, and he said, you know what? I haven't spoken with my father for 16 years. And, I mean, somebody tells you something like, I didn't, I didn't know what to say, I didn't say anything, and he looked at me, and he said, I think it's time I give him a call. That's the effect of Sheikh Muhammad Maloud in his grave in West Africa. Knowledge will benefit other people. I presented it here in the, in the area. My brother came up to me and he said he lives with his father. And he told me after he went through this, he said, I live with my father and for the, in the same apartment. You can imagine like how close you are. You're passing each other. He said he has not spoken to him for six months. Again, I looked at him and he said, I think I need to amend it. Um, <clears throat> another person, uh, I mean, there's just story after story after story. So I was like, oh, there's something here. So then I went and I, 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 did, I did more development. 
I translated some of the commentary. Uh, we eventually published this book uh, about 10 years ago, alhamdulillah, and we started also sending it into the prison. So just to show you some of the profound effect, somebody just read this book. Again, no teacher. He just re it's, it's For the adult learner, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, into some of the fiqh application, you would want to have somebody to help you navigate that, and that's why I mentioned in the book that, um, that if in that situation you want to seek out somebody who is a faqih, knows the fiqh, to help you in the application. But just reading it through, one brother who was on death row in San Quentin is still on death row. He read through the book, and so he wrote a letter to my daddy. This is a grown man on death row, became Muslim in prison. He said, Dear Dad, I've always wanted to speak with you. All my childhood, I wanted my father. When Father's Day would come around, I thought of you the most. <clears throat> Watching my friends and their fathers interact and a father's reaction when he opened his Father's Day gift from his dad, uh, from his dad. Uh, I would cry because I don't know where my father was. Mama would say, baby, dad's in the army and he'll be home one day, soon. I'd ask, mama, why don't he write or call? She would say, he will call. One day I asked mama, can you call my daddy? And she said, yes. And my dad was on the phone. I was five years old. My daddy said he loved me and wanted me to be a good boy. 54 years later, I can still hear my dad's voice. I've never seen or heard from you again. Daddy, until one day Mama got a letter in the mail from your wife, Daddy, telling me Johnny Lee Walker died 1976, August 16th. Daddy passed away. Daddy, I cried, ran outside. I could not face Mama, who had been waiting all those years. Daddy, Mama was never the same. She did not learn of your death until six months after you had died. Daddy, why you never called or came to see me, your son? Daddy, I was 21 years old when I learned you had died. I don't cry. I never stopped thinking of you, loving you, Daddy, I forgive you, and Mama, she loved you, Daddy, and never had a man to enter her bedroom, her door was always open for us kids, Mama would always say nice things about you, Daddy, she said, your Daddy loves you, Michael, you're the man of this house, I just want you to know in spirit, I love you, Daddy. SubhanAllah, uh, when I read that, I mean, it's, I mean, you can just... I don't have to explain how profound that, that's a profound effect on a person who never met his dad and wrote a letter to his dad, um, and there's a lot of processing that's happening there, a lot of, you know, it's not going to be completely resolved, but that was just through reading through this book. So I'm saying all that to say that this is, it, 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 is, it, it has a very, very powerful effect. Um, I started, I offered it online as a course, um, and, and I would see this, this, uh, this effect in many different instances. At the same time, there was also one thing that always came up. At the end of every single time of presenting this course, uh, going through this book, there was always one question that came up. Anybody want to take a guess about the question? And to maybe give you a hint, I'm talking about the, the book goes over the, all of the ayahs in the Quran and the hadith and the statements of the scholars and how much you respect and love you should have your, for your parents. And people really come out of that just like, it's like, you know, just like knocks the wind out of you. Like, whoa, I need to fix a lot of things. I've seen it in adults. I've seen it in children. Children as young as six. The parents would tell me after they studied this with you, they, they at Elm Tree, actually some of the kids there, uh, uh, one of the mothers said, my, my, my son is now better. You know, of course, he was a good kid, but he was, it, 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 it improved something. So, nonetheless, whenever I would present it, there was always one question that always get, uh, uh, gets asked. We're talking about rights of parents, rights of parents, respect parents, respect parents. That does, the children ask that. <laughs> they always that. And there's one section in the book, it's actually, and they, 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 they would ask that. They would say, when are we going to get to the rights of children? When are we? And then we get there and it's only two lines, three lines. They're like, that's all we get? <laughs> and I discussed that in the book of the reason why. And I think I mentioned that last time I was here. Because basically, if you don't give any instruction on the rights and responsibilities of parents or children, just take somebody who maybe doesn't even have an exposure to Islam or a Muslim who has not studied their deen, who's more likely to fulfill the rights of the other? The parents, because Allah has put that inherently in us, and so when He puts something inherently in us, there's no specific injunction or obligation. And so you can learn a lot about our soul, about our ruh, and about our tabi'ah, about our nature by, by kind of following the, the, the orders. If Allah is making something haram, what is that telling us about ourselves? If He's making something wajib, what is that telling us about Himself? If it's not, well, if it's not mentioned, then it's kind of, it's, they, they call it al wazigh al tab'i, and the ulama talk about it. They say it's basically it's the, the natural preventative. 
So if there's a natural preventative a, a, away from something, there's no specific sharia uh, uh, injunction uh, uh, about it. Allah just, he, he, he put that halal haram inside of us. So with the parents, that, that's the case. The kids still don't understand it, and, but nonetheless, it's like one of the stories I tell them, um, I found this online, it's a very beautiful story. A child was walking with his uh, son once he was in his, you know, a teenager in his 20s. It's a made up story. Or Allahu Alam, maybe it is true. And so he walked into a park and he asked his, the dad asked the son, he said, what is that? And the son said, that's a crow. A little bit later, he saw another crow and he said, dad, he asked his son, he said, son, what is that? He said, that's a crow. A little bit later, he asked again, what is that? He said, that's a crow. And then the fourth time, he's like, I, I, you've asked me four times, that's a crow. He said, when you were a little boy, we walked in the same exact park, and the first time you saw a crow, you asked me, whatever it was, 10 or 20 times, the same question, and every time I gently responded, and I told you, that's a crow, that's a crow. So that's the difference between the way a parent, their natural disposition, they have more forbearance, more patience. I mean, is your child gonna stay up all night if you're sick? Or are you going to stay up all night if you're sick? Um, so <clears throat> there's that. Uh, but there was one question that always gets asked. What, what if they're not good parents? Thank you. What if they're not good parents? What if they're abusive? I've had, I had a man come up to me at Isna, grown man. And um, I mentioned that just to say that, you know, like men by their tabi'a don't cry very easily. I saw my father in his life only uh, weep twice. And in Mauritania, the Bedouins, they never cry. Never. Like when it, when it talked, those hadith, when it talked, like I lived amongst, the, they never shed tears. Rarely do they shed tears. Um, and so, um, um, uh, subhanAllah, what was I saying? Um, oh, so a grown man came to me and he went through this course and then he asked me, he asked me that question. He said, what if my parents were, he said, my father is very, very uh, abusive towards me. Not physically, sexually, nothing else, just verbally. And he said he knows exactly what to say to just break me down. And there in the, in the bazaar of Isna, at our, at our, in front of our table, he started crying, asking me this question. Like he was seriously, he, he could not, like, on the one hand, he reads this book, The Rights of Parents, Rights of Parents, it's in the Quran, it's in the Hadith, okay, I understand that. On the other hand, here's a person who's toxic with him. And how do I, how do I balance that? And so the question came up a number of times, especially once people go through this, so I had to start developing responses, and the, the answers are in there. Uh, but people, it's hard for them to, 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 a lot of times, to figure out themselves when they see all of these lessons about the rights of parents, the rights of parents, the rights of parents. And especially with sometimes, especially with toxic parents, but even parents in general, eyes, they can weaponize Bir al-Walidayn. And they know especially how to weaponize the rights of parents and the respect of parents. And they'll say, you're ah, and you're, I just heard it a few weeks ago. Somebody like, I was trying to uh, make amends within a family and the father was like, tell them that they are, all four of them are uquq and they're going to hell and all that. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> um, and, but I could see how that, that understanding, like that you take this uquq al-walidain, which is like, when you read a hadith, that the, the Prophet ﷺ said, what are the two greatest sins? Shirk and what? Uquq al-walidain, disrespect of parents. What are the two greatest things? Um, tawheed, belief in uh, Allah, and bidr al-walidain. So now imagine in a, in a healthy relationship, that's gonna, that's gonna help the child uh, respect their parents, but in a, in, a, in a toxic situation, it can be weaponized and it's really, it's hard for them to resolve for, and I'm talking about, when I say children, I mean adult children, young children, children in general, it's hard for them to, to, to resolve that. So I've had to walk a lot of people through that, like how do you balance on the one hand the rights of parents with the reality that I have toxic parents and, I, and there's abuse and all forms of abuse, what do I do? Um, and so there's, uh, my, my plan actually for the next, the follow up to this is how to implement the rights of parents in those, you know, in those scenarios. Um, one of the books that I read and I feel is very, very good, it's a good companion to this. By the way, you can get this on, and I don't make any money from this, so this is not a, a plug, from Mecca Books. This book is, is, is available on Mecca Books. I don't make any money from it. I sold all of the books uh, to them, it was over 10 years ago. Incidentally, 
selling them the books actually paid for my master's in educational psychology. So <laughs> Sheikh Mohammed Mouloud also, you know, he has a lot of men uh, upon me. He has a lot of favor upon me. Uh, you can get this from uh, uh, Mecca Books and you can read through it just to understand. I, I'm not going to have time to go through the content. I'm really selling you the content uh, that you can read it on your own. And then what I would suggest as a follow-up, even if you don't have toxic parents or even if you feel that your parenting of your children is not toxic, and I believe that, you know, I have a personal fun with, with everyone who's here, read this just so you understand what's, what's like the two extremes. Because uh, it's almost like we want, we want to know what does toxic parenting look like? It's called Toxic Parents Overcoming Their Hurtful Legacy and Reclaiming Your Life by Susan Forward. And she has a follow-up, Toxic In-Laws, which that also comes up in, in when we talk about rights of parents because we're talking about your parents. Well, what about your spouse's parents? And all of the dynamics of in-laws and cultural expectations and so forth, that also adds to a lot of the complexity. And so I encourage people to read this book as a, as a, uh, as a side just to understand what does toxic parenting look like so you can do whatever you can to avoid it. Um, and um, that might seem like a like an extreme, but it is it's 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 real. I've I've done enough religious consultations, religious religious counseling of people who talk about the toxic situations, like in the in the one um, the one uh, scenario where somebody where the man was crying, weeping in, in in Isna, and I said, well, can you just do bare minimum, like just give him salams on Eid, go to their house? He said, if I step into his presence just for a few minutes. He knows exactly what to say, you know, just to like, just bring it all back, trigger him basically, the word. He knows how to, and he said, I can't. So I said, then just control, control the, the, um, the relationship by just sending him um, a card, you know, or sending him flowers that way. Because if you text him or if you call him, then you put it into that. And then I uh, advise him, him for counseling for him. I would advise somebody like in that situation for counseling just to repair the, the, themselves um, as, uh, to the best they can. Um, another person, uh, anyway, I can go into a lot of the horror stories. What I found is that this book alone Teaching your children the rights of parents or learning it yourself works when you have the average, you know how there's like the bell curve? So the average human being and, the, and what I found just from, this is anecdotally just from experiencing people, most people and most families, you're on the high end of the bell, bell curve. And so just reading this book, that's where you have like, okay, there's this profound effect. But then there's some people on the edges, whether it's abuse, whether it's neglect, whether it's too much permissiveness, whatever it might be, just some of the toxicity that, that, that occurs where it needs books, self-help, uh, and counseling. So I'm mentioning all that just to say that as you, you learn more about the rights of parents from our tradition, keep in mind that it can be weaponized and the, 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 the especially with children, they, they might not understand everything, especially younger children because they don't think abstractly, they think in concrete. So if, if a hadith says the anger of Allah is in the anger of the parents and the pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure of the parents. Well, what is a six or seven year old child going to think when my mom's angry at me? They're black and white thinking, concrete thinking, and so it's going to be the end of the world for them. So you have to, you have to understand that and, and make it easy for them. The other important thing for parents to understand the rights of parents, Sheikh Mohammed Mouloud mentions at the end, he says, وَيَا أَبَنْ أَعِنْ بُنَيَّكَ عَلَىٰ بِرِّكَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَلَّ وَعَلَىٰ قَالَىٰ تَعَاوَنُوا فَيَنْبَغِي لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ حَقٌ عَلَىٰ آخَرَ عَنْ أَنْ يُعِينَهُ عَلَيْهِ Those are the three lines for the rights of the parents. He said, basically, he said, O parent, um, help your child fulfill your rights. Help your child fulfill your rights. And because Allah says, تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَىٰ الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ like do have mutual assistance to to have bir to have righteousness and taqwa. There's a generalized bir, and then there's a specific bir of bir of parents. So there's a there's a double lesson there. And then he mentions a general rule that he says that if you have a right over somebody else, help them fulfill that right to you. So if you have a right, help them fulfill that right uh, to you. And so as a parent, you know you can just like one of the a good habit is just to, to not only forgive your children, like between you and, you and, you and Allah, so that you know on Yom Al-Qiyamah, they don't have, you, you're not going to run towards them for that haq. Because on that day, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي 
وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي You know, on that day you will run from your brothers, from your mother, from your father. Like all that closeness and proximity. On that day when you realize, I need my haqs, I need hasanat, I need to save myself, everybody's going to be running to the people that might have something that they could get. Um, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us salam and to give us safety on that day. So a good process is to forgive your children. Just forgive them. And then not only to forgive them, but to let them know, أنا راضي بيك. أنا راضي بيك. And explain to them the, uh, the, the, the concept of, um, um, you know, like, like in, in Jordan or in Palestine, they make a lot of dua, right? Like, what, 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 Allah عليك, and the, but the other for the parent is? The parent? Like, like يرضى, what is it? يرضى عليك والديك? Or is that Maghribi? The, Mar- the Moroccans? Okay, the Moroccans might say that. So they'll make a dua for people. May your parents have rida over you, for, for you. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, explaining to the kids that even some of these black and whites, that like, okay, I'm angry. And they're like, okay, I shouldn't do that. That's going to anger Allah. Yeah, and those are specifics. But let them know, like, my general relationship with you, my general fe- uh, feeling towards you is, I'm happy with you as my son. And let them know that. So, you know, like they say, tell your kids you love them, hug them. Even though you have the love languages of service and all of this, you actually have to say it so that they can, oh, my mom, my dad loves me. So also, I find it very beneficial that parents tell their children, look, I'm happy with you as a child. Because a lot of times people are, um, that's what they're searching for in life, right? A lot of what they do in life is to get the acceptance of their parents. Well, if you tell your kids, whatever you do, I'm accepting of you. I'm radli bik. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to get mad. You know, if you have your in the messy room or you don't do your homework or you yell, I'm going to hold you accountable. Plus, also, if the person shows uquq, I'm not going to have permissive parenting and be like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, I'm going to let you know I don't like that. And whatever methods, like I know you had over here some, some parenting methods, uh, whatever parenting methods you use to let them know, I'm, I'm not going to enable your behavior by constantly forgiving you. By constantly forgiving you. Um, I'm still going to forgive you, but I'm not going to let you think that this is okay. Like, it is wrong. And one of the things, to make it concrete for children, I've said, al walidain. I, I, I'll start off like this. I'll say, is eating pork bad? They're like, yeah. Is drinking alcohol bad? Like, yeah. I said, what about al walidain? And they can't make a connection. So I said, al walidain, disrespecting your parents is worse than eating pork and it's worse than drinking alcohol. And then I'll have fun with them. And I said, you know, and even if you make, mix it up together, and then the kids went wild with it. When one group of kids, they're like, even if you make like a smoothie and you make ice cream, and they call them alky pops and, you know, like alcohol popsicles. And I mean, they were just having a, but, it, but for them, it, it gave them like a, um, uh, a comparison. Like, okay, because there's all this, you know, you ask any Muslim kid about pork, they're like, ah. Right? Do they have that same reaction to uquq? But ultimately, what is worse? Now, you as a parent, you might like think, well, you know, it's easier to clean up the mess of the uquq by just saying, I forgive you, as opposed to like, you ate pork and all of that, you know? So there's, there's something there, like this visceral reaction that we have towards pork and alcohol, but in the grand scheme of things, disrespect of parents is worse. So we have to help them in a way to understand that while not weaponizing it. That's the, that's the challenge. I don't know how to do it. Every single parent is going to, you know, so there's gonna, you're going to have wins, you're going to have losses, you're going to, but generally as long as you have that intention to try to help them understand that, like generally I'm accept, you know, I accept you and I have some things that I need from you um, and then um, uh, help them understand the, the severity of uquq. Okay, I know it's almost maghrib. When I come back, I want to talk about a, a couple more things. But recently, and I just got these yesterday, alhamdulillah. So this is something we, we developed for our, um, I took this book and I wrote it for our students in prison. And most of them have like a sixth grade reading level. So I wrote it like I'm speaking to a sixth grader or a fifth grader. And we have like, I broke it down. I, um, I, I took concepts. I moved them around. I added certain things. We have like the KWL charts about uh, um, each, each, each subject. Um, we got, it's, it's in color. There's pictures and so forth, um, activities. And so we developed this for our students in prison. But then as, at once, you know, once we went through it, we're like, wow, you know, this is something the community could benefit from. So one of the things that we've been doing at Leba is also going to communities um, 
and saying, you know, alhamdulillah, we've been able to develop our organization through the generous support of the Muslim community, especially here in the Bay Area, and we now we want to give back. And so that's one of my intentions as well, you know, coming here. And I have free books for everybody who attended. Sorry, if you watch online, you're not going to be able to get one. Uh, and, and wallahi, I ordered all of these um, uh, a couple weeks ago when, when, when we had them. I said, just send me 25 to the office. I didn't know about this invitation because this was only about maybe two weeks ago. And then they just came yesterday. So I said, okay, perfect. Alhamdulillah. I'll be able to give, you know, uh, these are on Mecca books, but then you'll have this. It's self-explanatory, but then it can help you, you know, um, see how, how you can bring some of these, these ideas you know, uh, for, for, your, uh, uh, for your children. Like for example, just as one example, uh, I, um, in Surah Al-Isra, verse 17, 23 uh, to 25, this is like a very comprehensive ayah, three ayahs, it's called Ayat Al-Ta'fif, it's the ayah that says, uh, uf. don't say uf to them, and a number of other things. You know, you have the kids memorize this, understand that, you can bring it into Islamic studies, into Quran class, you know, just, just that ayah. And you know, it has a dua in it and so forth, and so some other activities. Um, and the last book, and then when we come back, I want to actually kind of workshop a few ideas. Um, we, I want to workshop a couple of the ideas because again, I'm not going to go through the content because I, I, I trust adult learners there. If you bought both of these, you would be able to, you know, bring everything up to speed and say, now the challenge is, how do we apply this in our parenting? How do we bring these lessons into our, uh, you know, into our children to help them learn the lessons and apply the lessons? And then for us to do that with our parents, because that's one of the most powerful ways to teach our children to model it. Like my daughter loves when she sees my mom check me. <laughs> right? Because she loves it. And I see her smile. I'm like, Sumaya, you like that? She's like, yeah. Because all that checking that I can do for my kids, and then I go to my mom, it's like, you know, you see there's a system. And then the, does anybody else have that? You know? And they're like, okay, my mom or dad is an adult, and their mom is just checking them. And they're just like, okay, yes, mom. You know? You know and my mom will, she will actually remind me, right? It's like, you translated the book, right? Yeah. Okay. Shape up. <laughs> It's like you're absolutely right. Um, alhamdulillah, it, it's made it made my uh, relationship with my parents so much better. Um, it, uh, it it keeps and it's it's a constant challenge to to really implement this. Um, and so, alhamdulillah, we have a we have a beautiful religion. One of the the, the ayahs or one of the hadith about the end of times. Will we hear the the adhan from here? Yes, we will. Oh, we will. Okay. One of the hadith of the end of times is that one of the signs is وَتَكْثُرُ um, الْعُقُوقِ Disrespect of parents is going to be all over the place, rampant, widespread. And that's what we're seeing. Absolutely. That's what we're seeing. And alhamdulillah, the Muslims don't have that as much. You know, there's... Um, <laughs> what's that? So I, I'm wondering, I maybe could address it after the break. So we're, we're teachers, right? And sometimes the, the school becomes the, the mediation zone. Yeah in households where there is... And you're a first responder. They might re open up to you about an issue before they, their parent even knows that it's an issue. Yeah, so in terms of toxic parenting, and it may not even be a, an intentional thing, it could be just, we've got a lot of families that are just in conflict and in you know, divorcing and going through really nasty, ugly divorces, and the kids are observing all these yeah. things. Yeah, or even, so if they're, they're, even if people are together, there's just a lot of yeah, toxicity they, every. There's just everywhere. Yeah. Marriages, yeah. Or whatever it may be. So we, we see this kind of coming out of the kids. And if there's, we want them to be respecting their parents, but they're learning, let's say they're learning from dad how to treat mom. Yeah, yeah. Or they're learning from their mom how to, how to speak. Dad, yeah. And it's really just nasty and ugly. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that's that's where we can talk. I don't have an answer for it, but um, uh, we we can use that. Maybe we'll pick up right from that point, like how to how to navigate that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So um, I I think did I sell you on reading the books on your own? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. You'll get them, and I'm going to provide these ones he here. Um, what what you'll find is most of it is is self-explanatory, and you know it intuitively all of the lessons there because of two things. Either through your own reading of an ayah in the Quran or a hadith, you've heard these lessons. You've heard them from your parents, you know them in the culture, you've heard it in khutbahs. What it does when we read books like this, it's just a compilation that kind of 
collects everything so that we can, uh, it gives us a framework to, um, um, to, to, understand, um, uh, to understand things. And then in our cultures too, and this is what I'm going to pick up on your question, like how do we teach this? How do we transfer this? Especially when we know that like in, this, uh, like in the school situation, you have kids coming from all different uh, backgrounds, all different family backgrounds. And so how do we, how do we help level, level the playing field when we don't have control over what's going on in the homes? And I want to start with, uh, with something before that, which is how do we know what we know? This is more of a, like a higher level question, but it, I'm going to relate it directly to the rights of parents and, and just to give us a framework. So um, one of the, one of, when you hear the word hukum, it usually people think, okay, that's legal ruling, that's a ruling. But hukum just means a judgment. So if I say this phone case is black, that's a hukum. Like I've, I say, when I, and I, when, I, when I either make an affirmation or a negation, I say, this is black, this is not red. Those are hukum, it's a nefi or, or an ithbat. And so everything we know is a hukum, is a judgment. We're, we're making a judgment on things. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, I'm not judgmental. No, everybody is judgmental. We're making judgments every second, you know, just for our own safety and security, just to know that like, okay, I'm safe, you know, I need to run. We're making judgments, assessments all of the time. Um, but how do we make the, or what are the different types of judgments? So I'm going to ask you this. What are the different, like, how do we, when we say this is blank or this is not blank, what are the sources of knowing that? What are the different ways that we can know that? Just guess. Seeing it. Seeing it, okay. So that's like by convention. Mm -hmm. In Arabic, they call that hukum adi which means like ad experience. So we know things by experience. The sun sets in the sun rises in the east, it sets in the west. That's a hukum. You don't even need to have an intellect. People can understand as long as they know, oh, the sun rises over there and the sun sets over there. You might even have somebody that's cognitively impaired and is not able to maybe ha have higher level cognitive functioning, but they can, if you say, where is the sun? The sun is there, the sun is not there. So that's by convention and by experience. So that's one major source of how we know things. What's another one? Knowledge, knowledge, what you've been knowledge right? What you've been taught, yeah. Okay, what you've been taught, but where does that knowledge come from? So you said knowledge, or like what type of knowledge? It could be from experience, could be from like formal studying. Formal studying of what? Information. Is this all knowledge? Hmm? Either, ultimately, all knowledge I thought is either experience, uh, you know, reasoning or wahi. Right? There it is. You get, okay, so you got it. Yeah, experience, reasoning, or wahi. So experience is hukum adi. Um, uh, uh, then reasoning is cognitive. It's hukum aqli. It's like uh, if if somebody were to come and tell you one plus one is two. Right? That's, you don't need, you can be, a person could be an atheist, they know that. You don't have to see anything, you don't have to see the rising or the setting of the sun to know that that's true. That's a statement we're saying one plus one is two, one plus one is not three. Um, and so that's a hukum aqli uh, um, by, by intellect. And then the third one is by wahi, revelation. Um, and so if somebody were, were to come to you and say, uh, well, it doesn't make sense that Adam is the first person. We're like, well, because we're not basing it on experience. I don't care what you find in the ground. And we're not basing it on, um, uh, on, on intellectual. We're basing that hukum. When we say Adam is the first man, Hawa, uh, Eve is the first woman, that's a hukum. We've, we've made a statement that's based on wahi. So that gives us a framework to kind of know where it is that where things uh, fit into um, the, those, those three sources. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'd like to tie it back to parents. When, 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 when parents, any culture develops... Rules and responsibilities, rights, etiquettes of how to interact with your parents. And I would say that a, that, that a lot of people, where are their, how are they making those determinations? Most people, Muslim or non-Muslim. From the way they were raised. From the way they were raised, Exper which is experience. Is it, so is it hukum adi, where they're just like, like noticing things? Or are they really like coming about, you know, coming to it based on logical reasoning? Is there an element of that? What would be the logical reasoning there? 
basically seeing what your parents did and saying like this was good, that was bad. And, and Okay, and the kids, they do that, right? I'm sure all of you who have kids, right? Mom, you do so much for me. You know, they do something nice. Oh, thank you. Uh, when I used to teach, I used to always use the word Timmy. Like, you know, Timmy was, instead of, you know, saying Bob or whatever. So, do you remember Timmy? I used to always say, yeah. So then Timmy did this or Timmy did that. And then one day there was like, uh, Timmy, there was a story where, I don't know, he went to a masjid or something. One of the kids was like, oh, say Uncle Rami, Timmy's Muslim? I'm like, yeah, this whole time Timmy's been Muslim. They're like, well, how can Timmy be Muslim? I'm like, why can't he be Muslim? And I, I was doing that intentionally. You know, I don't have to say Ahmed or Bilal. I can say Timmy. Um, and so, uh, so, so Timmy does something really nice. And you say, thank you, Timmy, for doing that. And he's like, well, you do so much for me. Right? Part of it is it, part of his experience, part of it is like that logical thing. He's able to make those, and some of the ulama say that, the, that those are actually connected because your experiencing of the world is, is logical. You're witnessing of the sun. So they're, they're really close uh, together. When we talk about the rights of the parents, a lot of these, the, you know, this is how you treat your parents, this is how you don't treat your parents, this is wahi, right? This is the, the hukum wahi. Now, our societies, are they based purely on this? They're not. Would you say, that, or would you agree with, with, if I were to say, that most people's interaction with their parents is not based on the wahi, it's based on just what they've known? So, so part of part of sifting through that is to go back, okay, to the books and just, oh, okay, this, that part is okay. That's from the wahi, but this is from the adi, um, and and to sift through that to figure out, okay, what's what's um, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. There's a lot of things in our cultures that is acceptable, that is congruent with the wahi, and so we 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 accept that. So one of the going back to your question, sister, earlier about how do we. How do we deal with that in, in the school situation or in a community situation? It's by, I feel, by modeling as close as we can that wahi model so that they can, the child can start to notice it. Because you know your children, even very young, they can point out hypocrisies. They can point out fall fallacies, sometimes quicker than us, right? They've all done it to us. But you said this. I mean, like, wow, you're right. They can point those out. So if we present, even if we're not, you know, uh, if we're not fulfilling it, if we tell one of these stories, like this is how the Sahaba were with their parents. That's one way of modeling, telling them the, the, those stories. The other thing is to also, um, however we, you know, bring it up, if, if it comes up in a, in, a, in a classroom or in a discussion where you talk about the optimum. And so that if a child is coming from a, a, a house where that's not being modeled, and I'll give, it, I'll, I'll give an example. Say, for example, like um, humiliating people, right? Like hum just mocking or humiliating people. It happens, right? Are there some parents out there who just, whether it's wife to husband, husband to wife, they just mock and humiliate? look down upon, they do it to their kids. And then those kids come into the school system and then they do it and it's like, you know, it starts go, going down. Um, so we know that happens. So it, all of that, like I think over here it says, um, you know, to live with my life with excellence at all, all times, this type of like pledge, is it, do they say this in the morning every day? So instead of the Pledge of Allegiance? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. Um, so, so even if it's against myself, yeah. So we model for them those the, those things, and we can. It's not going to be a surefire um, uh, uh, protection, but as long as we can keep up the model and, and mention it and talk about it and discuss it and bring it into the classroom, then we can we can start addressing uh, some of those issues. Last time when I was here, we were talking about stories, and you mentioned the book. What is the name of the book? Um, I actually bought it. I started reading it about the the stories and uh, virtues. Um, Tending the heart of virtue. Tending the heart, yeah, tending the heart. So one thing, uh, one way of, of, um, of, of talking about, uh, especially with children, about a healthy parent relationship is fairy tales. Because in all of those stories, right, think of all those stories, there's a lot of, there's, there's a parent uh, dynamic in there. Unfortunately, a lot of those stories, it's like, you know, the, it's, just, it's the evil stepmother or, you know, the dad's gone. Like almost every Disney story, the dad's not there, right? I took my kids and my uh, nieces a few years back. You know the dinosaur story? I don't know the cartoon. No, it was a, it was a Disney uh, dinosaur. What was it? Once upon a time. Yeah, once upon a time. We went there, and within the first 10 minutes, the dad drowns. And I'm like, 
what is that? Like, you, and it was, you know, and I could see my kids, it's like, it's traumatic for them. So I'm like, why does a dad always have to die and he's not there and he's missing? With that said, if, you know, those, those stories, there's something that's, that's being told in those stories. Like, for example, the domineering parent, right? Whether it's the evil stepmother or the parent, right? There's a, there's a recurring theme of this domineering parent. And so you can bring up those uh, discussions with your, with your children, with your students, and talk about, okay, well, here's the domineering parent. How do we deal with a domineering parent and making sure to have my healthy boundaries, protect myself, is that what it says? Uh, to live with, okay, no, there's, uh, yeah, but just like to make sure to, to do self-preservation, that's important too. Birul Walidain is important, but your dignity is also important. And so how do you balance that? Um, one of the stories that's covered in here is one of the Sahaba who's, uh, and it's the story is mentioned in the Quran, where his mother told him, you know, he became Muslim, and then she said, come back to, you know, worshiping the idols. He refused. What did she do? She went out into the hot de desert Meccan sun. She said, I'm not going to drink any water. I'm not going to eat any food. I'm not going to brush my hair. Basically, I'm going to die of exposure unless you come, to, uh, come back to Islam. And that story is mentioned in the Quran that says, in jahadaka ala in bihi, you know, if they, if, they, if they both struggle, then to, to, to get you to do kufr, which is the worst thing, what does it say? Do not obey them. And speak to them in a noble or a kind speech. So in other words, okay, you can have both. It doesn't mean just complete, um, complete, um, um, not only obedience, but like meekness. What is there? There's a word like, yeah, but complete submission. Like what's a, a word for like, um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Complete. Hmm? Yeah, like yourself. Like Birul Walidain doesn't mean parent worship does not mean parent worship. And unfortunately, some people, they've, that's been brought into their cultures. You obey me no matter what. And so we have to teach our children, look, you can, um, and I've had to do this with my children, I want, you to, I, I want you to disagree with me. I want you to be able to know how to find your voice, advocate for yourself, establish your boundaries, say when something, you know, you, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't like something, but just do it in a respectful manner. That's what I always say, right? And I'm sure all of the parents here is like, listen, you can say that, you can voice your dissent, you can do all of that. Hopefully, everybody <clears throat> allows that in the home. You can voice your dissent, <clears throat> just do it in a respectful manner. Um, so if we're doing that in the classroom, we're showing them this is Islam. Even the Sahaba could speak up in the presence of the Messenger of Allah. Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I don't think that's the right way to do things. And it would be respectful. Sometimes he would say, well, what is it that's call it causing you, O oh, Omar, to, to reject this? Um, and so there's a lot of stories where that, that pushback is allowed. And if we don't allow it in our houses, then we create these meek, you know, just people submissive that, no, yes, mom, yes, baba, na'am, baba, yeah. Never, that, that's their idea of bitter walidain, which that's not what respect to the parent is. And then they go out in the world. Um, to give you an example, and, and subhanAllah, this, um, I gave this talk, I mentioned this story in Florida, it was being recorded, so that's, you know, things can go viral, and then the Taiba marketing team, they just did, took this clip, and then it went viral, it has like 300,000 views, I'll tell you the story, like when you see something go viral, like that's touching something, right, there's something there. Mm -hmm. So the story I said was, that I, was in, uh, I, I was in a community, we were talking about the rights of parents, and I said, I, I kind of like to push, you know, push the envelope, like they say, or, you know, stir the pot. Yeah? Oh, you watched that? Okay, so you've seen that, the stir the pot video. Okay, so I said, I like to stir the pot. And I was in a community, and I said, you know, just to, just to let you know, when we talk about the rights of the parents, that's talking about your parents, and your obedience to your parents, and your service to your parents. It does not extend in the same exact way to your in-laws. So when you get married, you don't have to live with your in-laws. And now I was, I, I mentioned that, you know, I said a wife has the right to demand her own housing. She does not have, if she wants to, if she's okay with it, that's fine. But a wife has the right to her own residence. She doesn't have to live with the, 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 the in-laws. Um, and when I presented that in the masjid, everybody who was just kind of like, you know, listening, they all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they stood up, the hands, but, 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 but what about this? And it, so I saw that reaction on the men's side and my wife was on the women's side. She said, you should have seen on the women's side. <laughs> Because they're like, what do you mean? You know, if I want to live with my, my, my son and his wife, I'm going to be living with them. You know, 
Well, that's not the Sharia. So we're going back to like, where does that hukum come from? Where do people think that they have the right to say, I am your father, you're, I'm going to live with you no matter what. Or you and your family are going to live, you know, that, those type of hukums. It's not coming from the Sharia, it's coming from Ada. It's coming from cultures. Uh, and so we have to be able to, um, to distinguish between that. There was one person, I mean, and it can get very toxic where, you know, if the, if the, if the wife and the mother-in-law just, you know, the, that, that, that tension, and now the son, he has a duty to his wife and his children, and he has a duty to his, his parents. How do you navigate that? And throughout that whole navigation, we're modeling for the kids. Because how, do, how else does that culture get passed from generation to generation? So part of it is, part of the tajdeed of the deen and, and, and renewing the deen is to say, okay, hold on a second, I need to step back and I need to go back to the asl. I need to go back to the wahi, the revelation, and say, what is the hukum shari? What is the sharia uh, 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 ruling? And then now the challenge is, okay, how do I bring it into the, the, this life? Because it's not easy. That's this. The easy part is for you to buy this books, to look at it, to 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 see everything. And the one of the proofs that I would present of why it's not easy is that I've seen ulama fail at this. I've seen ulama fail at being able to to have a healthy relationship with their children because the, something was off in the relationship. So you might have somebody that knows all of the hukum shari, he could tell you, rattle it off the top of, you do this, you do this, you do this, but when it comes to application with their child, there's a huge disconnect. And then you have some people who don't have much knowledge of the sharia, but they have just experiential knowledge, they have a good demeanor disposition, and their application of the sharia is closer to the hukum shari than that scholar. So realizing that now when we go back to saying, okay, the challenge is now how do we bring this into our life? Don't just look at the ulama and don't look at the shiuch and don't always think that the solutions are going to come from asking the sheikh or the sheikha. Um, and sometimes, uh, like this, uh, our accountant for, our, for, for Tayba, he mentioned this to me. He said, he said uh, shiuch make the worst business people. And I said, why? He said, um, uh, uh, he said, because they were, never, that, they were never trained in that. They were trained in Sharia. They were not trained, you know, in, in how to run a business. And he said, and uh, he also said, doctors also as well. Sometimes because they went for years and years to medical school, they were never taught how to actually run a, run a clinic or run, or actually, I don't know, do, are they? Do they? They don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the, so now you have to figure all of that out. Uh, and I mentioned that to my father. No, sorry. I, he said, uh, the, the accountant told me, he said, lawyers make the worst business people because they spend all this time studying law and not how to run a clinic. I mentioned that to my father-in-law, who's a physician. He said, and I will say doctors too. And he's a physician. He said, because they never train us how to run a business and having a clinic is a business. So I'm saying that to say that when, when an issue arises, if you go to the sheikh for the fatwa, that might not be the solution. In fact... Sometimes, because of that disconnect, the fatwa might not be placed on the, uh, on the situation properly. Um, and there, there's, there is a, an example where um, it just it happened recently, and it, it, it il illustrates this. I'm trying to uh, think about it. SubhanAllah, what was the example? Oh, this is the night of the Mawlid, right? It's the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, so alhamdulillah, we're starting off on a good way, talking about his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and celebrating his blessed birth, which there's a, there's a khilaf amongst the ulama, was he born after Fajr or before Fajr? And so many say he was born before Fajr, so the night, uh, this night uh, is, is the night of his birth sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the day he made hijrah, he came into Medina on the 12th, and he passed away on the 12th of, uh, of Rabi' al-Awwal, so it's a, mashallah, very uh, mubarak, uh, mubarak time. Um, so, subhanAllah, if the example comes to me, but basically there was, a, there was a contentious relationship between child and parent. They go to the sheikh, the sheikh's advice is just like a general thing, like, you know, just obey your parents and, you know, bidul wadidain kind of a thing. Well, that's not going to solve the issue. So now how do, we, how do we figure that out? So part of it is going to be getting the hukum shari, but and this is the example that I use. You know, the round you know how they say the round table? What is it? It's a legend, right? King Arthur and the, 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 knights, of the, round the knights of the round table. It w why was that phenomenal? Like that idea of the round table. What was so... Hmm? Like, even though they were knights, they were doing mashwara. Basically. They were doing mashwara. They were doing shura. Because the, the, the tables used to look like this, right? 
and you go to conference tables and conference rooms, there's, it's always rectangular. Why? Why is it like that? Hierarchy. Hierarchy, because the person who sits at the head of the table, everybody knows that like that's that's the qawl al akhir. Um, that's the final the, the final stay goes with that person. But King Arthur in that legend, he oh he had this amazing thing. He had the knights of the round table, and they you know he had the shura. Well, who had it before him? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had his halqa. And the Quran says, you know, uh, that if once, you know, when somebody joins the halaqa, make room and make the circle bigger. And the circle, they're also all sitting on the ground. And he was such a part of his people that you'll see this in, in multiple narrations that when people who had heard about him, but they never saw him, sallallahu alayhi wa when they would come into that sitting, what would they say? They didn't know. They would say, Ayyukum Muhammad. Which of you is Muhammad? <clears throat> Think about that. Which of you is Muhammad? That means he sat with his people. They said he wore the clothes of his people. He had nothing distinguishing from, him, from, from his people. He was with his people and his shura, he was actually one of the khasa'is, one of the things that's specific to him is that for him, shura was wajib. It was an obligation. Washawirhum fil amr. Allah told him, He says, seek their counsel. For us, it's highly recommended. At times it could be obligatory. But he was teaching us, and Allah was teaching him to then by default teach us, this idea of shura is important. The, the answer is not just with one person. It's with multiple people. And when you see that, there's many stories where, um, uh, like for example, one of the stories of the sandal of the Prophet ﷺ. I know we usually see the, the symbol. There it is right there, right? That symbol. And people ask, where, how do we know that symbol? That the sandal, the actual sandal of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Dar al-Hadith al-Ashrafiyyah, where Imam Noah we studied, the actual sandal, and they had a senad to it. And it goes back to his wife, Maymuna, radiallahu anha. She had the sandals after he passed away, one of the sandals, and she gave it to somebody who gave it to somebody, and the, and the taking care of the sandals went all the way down uh, to a person um, who eventually came to Damascus area, the king at the time, his name was Al-Malik Al-Ashraf, Al -Ashraf, and he invited him to, to, to live in the area. And it's a long story. When he brought it in, when he brought the sandal into his presence, he said, let me, can, can I have the sandal? And he said, no, sorry. He, he used to wear the sandal of the Prophet around his neck, and he would take it around to show, to let people see this is his sandal. And so then Al-Malik Al-Ashraf said, um, can I have just a sliver? Can I just cut, because it was leather, can I just cut a piece off of it? And so he said, let me think about it. Mm -hmm. So that night, uh, uh, the, uh, the King Ashraf thought to himself, he said, no, you know what? If I ask for a sliver, what's going to happen to the next ruler? He's going to ask for a piece, and then what's going to happen? Somebody's going to take, it's like the, the, the archer's hill uh, at Uhud. The mountain has actually gone down because everybody that goes there like, oh, let me take a souvenir. Let me take a rock. Well, you take millions of people taking rocks. The mountain has actually like shrunk the hill. So he said, I'm he, he remembered the hadith, if you leave something for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you something that's better than it. So he said, I'm going to just tell him, you know, uh, I don't want a sliver. But then he, the next day he said, I'm, uh, I don't want the sliver of the, the sandal, but please bless us with your presence. I'm going to give you a salary. And then every Monday and Thursday, come into the court and show the sandal. So he did that. And when uh, the, the person passed away, he wrote in his wasiyya, the, the, the taking care of the sandal goes to who? Ashraf, the King Ashraf. And then uh, King Ashraf built a hadith school to, to teach the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to, to house the Prophet, uh, to house the, house the sandal. And they would open it up every Monday and Thursday. People would look at the sandal. People coming from nearby, uh, Egypt, Syria, uh, those other areas, they could actually look at it. People coming from the Maghrib, they're traveling. They're on their way to Hajj or so forth. And so a lot of those scholars would actually sketch it out. And so in the hadith books that narrate that hadith of that sandal, they actually have the sketch, and that's where we have the sketch of that sandal. So it's not just a random you know, uh, uh, sandal. Well, one of the hadiths about the sandals is, uh, is the Prophet ﷺ was with his sahaba in Medina, and he got up, he left the majlis, and he walked off. And they said he, he, he didn't come back quickly, and so they were a little bit worried. 
And some of the, 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 the scholars, when they mentioned this, they said in the early communities, Medina wasn't fully established um, even in terms of security. So they were a little bit worried uh, about him. Plus, they just, in general, he didn't come back. Like, if I didn't come back after this, this thing, right? Like, even though we have security here, like, well, what happened to Rami, you know? Um, so, they, so Abu Huraira was the first one to, 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 to go look for him. And in Medina, because it was a city with a lot of date palms, there was all of these adobe walls and structures, and some of them are broken, some of them have holes in them and so forth. So he found where he was and he said, I found a hole in this, in this wall and I went through it like a fox goes through a, uh, uh, a hole in the fence and I found the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting there and he said, where, where, where are you? We were worried about you. So then he gives him his sandals and he says, here Abu Huraira, take these sandals, go out and whoever you meet, Tell them if they say La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, they will go into paradise. So he goes out. The first person he meets is another Sahabi who was also worried, was looking for him, and it was Umar. Now Abu Huraira was a very, very, so I mean, he has kittens, right? His name is Abu Huraira, the, the person with the kittens, and he meets Umar, so you can imagine that. So, so Umar is looking at this like, we're, we're missing the Prophet, Abu Huraira has the sandals, you're coming out of this fence like a fox coming out of like, what's going on? He's like, Abu Huraira, what's going on? And he said he pushed him back, and Abu Huraira said, until I fell, on my, you know, I fell down. And the way he mentions it is his eyes welled up with tears. You all have children, right? You know, before they, 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 you know, happened to me last night, it broke my heart. Hassan, I said something to him and his eyes welled up with tears, you know, and just like, you, you know, like even before they start dripping, the welling up. So Abu Huraira said, you know, my, my eye, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? My eyes welled up with, with, with tears and uh, I to, he told him the story. The Messenger of Allah gave me this. He said, go out. He said, don't tell this to people. He said, because if you tell people, all you have to do is say, La ilaha illallah, they're not going to do any good actions. And so now they both go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet now sees like Abu Huraira coming back after he gave him the sandals and the message, and he says, what's going on? And he's, they tell him the story, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't say, hey, Omar, why did you negate my order? Why, wh what, who are you to reject what I said? He said, ma hamalaka. Like, what caused you to say that, Omar? Like, he was interested. What is your reasoning, Omar? What is your reasoning behind that? And he told him his reasoning, and the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, you're, you know, th that's correct. Um, he accepted it. And so it's, a, it's also a type of, like, abrogation that, that not that the Prophet was wrong, وسلم, because that, that message was true, it was valid, and he just decided afterwards to abrogate his own ruling based on the advice of Omar. Um, I mention that just to say that if this is the Prophet وسلم, with his Sahaba, that's how we should be with our children. Really encouraging dialogue. If they don't accept something, it's not just like, hey, I'm the mom or dad, you know, you pull the bitter Walidain card, like, you know. So how can we, how can we uh, encourage that uh, into bringing it into our, uh, into our house? Um, one of the, uh, the things, of course, now, when we go to how do we do that, you can, I'm sure you've all had conversations, right? My child is doing this. What, how, what, would, what advice would you give? And so that's one way that we're going to have, uh, we're going to outsource that knowledge. We can also look at modern uh, parenting um, methods. I think up here, what was it? Shoal parenting? Not familiar with that. Scole. Scole, okay. What is that? So, scole is the Latin word for leisure, which is like just calm parenting. Mm. Not about. Um, you know, just re learning to be in the presence of our children and our families without the upheaval of like the work and anxieties that we have. And so, one of the goals for for Advantes is for us to become intentional in our mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, parts of the, these dialogues and discussions is for us to is for us to start absorbing the information and then thinking about how do we apply them? How do we you know, going back to, you know, ad fontes, going back to the fountain, back to the source. Like, back to the source, we, yeah. This is so profound because these are parts of our traditions from the Sunnah, like you said, it's from the Quran. And so, and so taking that and being intentional about it, because in this harried world, we have so many things to do and so much happening um, every single day in our lives from the time that we wake up to the time that we yeah. sleep. How do we then raise families at this time, how do we interact with our spouses at this time, we, we kind of have to re-figure it out as Muslims, because things have, like, um, 
Dr. Omar Abdullah said, we veered away from our Adamic purpose so much mm -hmm. as people, you know, like the purpose with which we were actually created. And so how do we then redefine that for ourselves a little bit, you know, and kind of come to terms with what we're doing and how yeah. we're living in society? And asking ourselves, like, like questioning ourselves. Yeah. Like we have to, you have to, like when you said intentional, it's also like we have to, one of the things that we have to um, suspend judgment. Suspend judgment. That's one of the, the most powerful things that you can do to, to really to be present is yeah. to suspend your judgment. So, for example, you watch a, if you watch a movie or you will read a book or something, you can't just keep, like, if you're reading a story, whatever, you know, story, say Star Wars, right? You're, we're watching Star Wars. That, that doesn't make sense. You know, if you keep, like, if you keep saying that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense, you're not going to enjoy it. You have to suspend the judgment and say, okay, just for a moment, I'm going to go into la-la land and just experience that, you know, and if somebody's like, well, that doesn't make sense, stop talking, like, you know, we're trying to be present in the moment. Well, the same thing with, 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 with interactions with people, if you really want to understand what they're going through, like active listening, open listening, to me, I find that one of the best ways to really, uh, for parenting, and this is what, in this book, if you don't have it already, PET, I can't say that I've read the whole thing, but I've gone through uh, he has one of, one of the, the, the areas that I spend a lot is the 12 roadblocks to listening. The 12 roadblocks to listening. A lot of what happens with parents and kids, especially because of the, the hierarchy and you know you have the age of the kids, like even the, even the size. One brother pointed that out to me. He said, he said, we're like giants with our kids. Like it's when they're younger, right? And so there's like a Dawood Jalut kind of a interaction going on there. So that has a certain level of Heba going on there. And then that's your parent, your mom. So they might not be able to voice their, their, um, their opposition or know how to do it. So we have to help them do that. To be able to, one of the, the, the ways to do that is to be able to listen. And one of the best ways to listen is to watch out for the roadblocks to listening. So he goes through, and if you just type it in online, uh, 12 roadblocks to listening. Uh, it's really intriguing. I'm trying to find something. Like one of them is um, uh, problem solving. And nobody, else, you, you, I think we all can relate to that, right? You're talking to somebody and they're like, jump into problem solving mode. Like, hold on a second. You're, you're not listening to what I'm talking about. Another one is giving advice. And so you can, you can switch the dynamic first by suspending your own judgment, both on what's going on in that situation and also what you feel about that situation, and just listen, asking open questions and, okay, so what happened? Um, what's going on? What, why, what, what makes you feel that or, or, or think that way? Um, and as we're, as we're modeling this for our kids, the other thing is, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this, where have you had friends come up to you and say my parent or my mom is going through yeah yeah you have right okay so the first responders are their peers are their kids so now we have to also help train the trainers train the first responders like tell our kids you're going to be your your friends are going to open up things with you that they've never opened up with anybody else right their parents their shiu their teachers right maybe even their siblings right Right. So, so now, how do we equip them to do that? So it's not just about okay, we're the parents, we're in here, we're 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 buying the books, we're doing all that. But now we have to remember our kids are going to be first responders in those situations. They're going to see things, and they're going to be, and they're going to know inherently from their fitra, they're going to know when something's wrong. All of your kids, right? When they're like, that's not right. Or recently, I was reading a story. Hassan, he's seven. Uh, he really, really, he's like intense. I call him, he's, the, he's our Arabi, like, <laughs> he's our Arabi because he's loud and he's intense and he's emotional. And when we're reading stories, what story was I reading? Oh, it was one of the Beatrix Potter uh, stories. Um, can't remember. There was a goose and a fox and whatever, and the fox was trying to, like, eat the, eat the thing. And he's like, no, that's not right. He can't, like, he wants to jump into the story and, like, and... What's that? And fix it. Yeah. So what, what's that telling us is like the fitra of the child is there. They can know, like, does he need a fatwa to know that that's haram, like what that fox is doing to the duck? He, they know it by their fitra. So we're in, like, they're going to go out into the world. They're listening to fairy tales, listening to stories. They're going to know. They're going to hear something. And they're like, that's wrong. There's something wrong about that. And their friends are going to open up to them about that. And now they have to be able to say, all right, how can we now bring this wahi into that situation and help you understand that? That's a challenge, too. It's how to equip our, our first responders, the teachers, the other kids. Um, and, okay, I, I got digressed from the rounds table and so forth. 
that's that's in my I, in in my view, that's where the person who represents the Sharia, whether it's the Ustad, Ustada, Islamic Studies teacher, Sheikh, Sheikh, they have one seat at that round table. They have one seat. But there's knowledge that you have as a mother, and you know this. There's no fathers in here, right? Are you you're not, are you dad yet? Okay. Where are the dads? Hey, dads. If you're, if you're on daddy daycare duty, you have an excuse. But if you're not, or if you have an older child, like somebody that's over 12, you also don't have an excuse. So dads, where are you? Um, and um, in fact, side note, but in the Maliki school, it's makru for a man to lead a jama'ah of only women. Of only women. So there's something there. Like it's, there's no khalwa. But there's like, we need to, have, like how you were saying, we need the dad's voice, right? So the dad's voice is, we're missing that in, the, in, in this room. Um, and one of the things in, in dialogue training, dialogue as a practice, I've, I've taken some training on that, is one of, the, to, to have a proper dialogue, you need all the relevant voices in the room. So we need the dads, alhamdulillah, we have the children, you know, you know the, we have, so we need to have all those voices. Because if we opened up a dialogue about how to apply this, we need to hear that. We need to hear the moms, we need to hear the dads, we need to hear the other kids, and, and sometimes, like, you'll be surprised. Have you ever, has anybody asked their kids, like, what's something we can change in our family? Anybody ever asked their kids that? They might want to, maybe? Something similar, they, they, don't, they don't always reply. They don't reply. Sometimes, they, maybe they don't know yet, or they're not, uh, you, have to, you have to make it uh, acceptable. Right? I asked my son this. I was like, if there was one, and then the one way to ask is one small change. Not, I'm something I'm doing wrong. Just ask him, what's one small change that I could, that I could do that you would like to see me do? And I asked my son, and it surprised me because I, I was thinking he was going to say something else, but he said something. He was like, um, he said, now see, I'm going to open up, but he said, don't yell at other drivers. <laughs> I was like, that's it? I can work on that. <laughs> like as, as my son, I'm like in the car, but it's because he's very sensitive and he's sensitive to the feelings of other people. And so if I say, hey man, well, use your signal. You know, like it's true, but he's like, you, you could, if, you know, the person didn't even hear what I said, but he did. And so now I'm more conscious about that. So, so try that, you know, just, just encourage their voice. Um, and, and again, I'm not speaking as, as a teacher. I'm speaking as just your fellow, your peer, somebody who's also trying to figure this out. Um, and, um, and these are some tools that have helped me. I want to leave the last half hour for questions and discussion. Um, and so I know I've thrown a lot out there. Um, hopefully it gave you some, you know, uh, it's more inspirational than it is informational. Uh, but from here, like now we can say, what's next? What's, one, of the, one of the things that I learned from, I've gotten some coaching over the years and benefited from it. He said, you know, it's the growth edge. Just that one little change. You're not, we're not looking for major changes. We're just talking about how can we just, you know, move the, move the needle just a quarter of an inch. What's one small change that we can do? We do enough of those, eventually it's going to have a, have a big change. Um, so... Any questions, comments, discussion, application, ideas, maybe? Something that's worked for, for you? I want to say, like, mashallah, um, my children, my daughter, who's here with my other one as well, uh, heard a lot of Timmy stories when they were little. Oh, yeah? And, uh, and, and they took this class with you, mashallah, when you were teaching it. And... You know, we can definitely see the impact of it in the way that they. Oh, thank you. Uh, we can definitely see the impact of it in the way that they interact with, with us as their parents, and then the references through the years that mm -hmm. they've made to it. Oh, and really? Say, yeah, definitely. Oh, wow. And I'll definitely say that. Um, you know, when I was mentioning this to the parents the other night as well, I've seen the big impact of it mm. in the way that. Um, it's, it's impacted our, our daughters and our family by extension. So yeah. um, the wisdom of the past is definitely so profound and our dean definitely has answers to some of the most, you know, complex questions of our time. And if we just search back into it and then f create forums of discussion of how to implement and what to do and what worked for you and what didn't work for you and things like that. It yeah. it, it, it's a... Alhamdulillah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And, and I know that it's not easy because a couple of things happen. Like, if you try to go back and teach your kids this book, what's going to happen? Is it going to land well? No, because there's a conflict of interest there. 
It's in your interest. The kid's going to know that, right? So one of the benefits, like for me, is like I wasn't their parent. Mm -hmm. So you have to. One of the main things is to have mentors outside of your house, whether it's the youth halaqa leaders, the other teachers. You know, you parenting is not just yourself. Like the 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 the, the saying, it takes a village. It does. You need people outside. You need the, they have to have good friends and you know other other mentors um, to help um, in in some of those lessons. So that's one difficulty. That's one challenge. Like you can know all the rules, and there is a way that you can you can transfer them because it's even in in terms of your your requirements of them. Like yelling is not allowed. Like they roll their eyes. Um, if a, if a kid rolls their eyes, well, no, you can't do that. Well, what's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal. Let me explain it to you. It is a big deal, and I don't accept. Well, even if they don't accept, they don't understand it. Like logically, you have to say, "There's like that's a red line. You're not going to roll your eyes. You're not ah, all of that stuff." You know, like the, that's the uff. The uff is the 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 Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if Allah knew of something lower than uff, he would have mentioned it. He tell like, does it say anywhere in the Quran? Don't hit your parents. Don't curse your parents. No, because he covered all of that by saying, don't say uff. And uff, they said, is edna kalima. Like in Arab cultures, and I think in, in Afghan cultures, they say uff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Mauritania, there's a souk, they call it souk uff. It's the fish market, and there's no refrigeration. So like, <laughs> I stepped out of a taxi one time, and the first thing I said was uff. <laughs> and they're like, yep, that's where you are, souk uff. Um, so uff is just like, uh, you know, that, 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 like that, um, that, Breath of frustration, ah, you know, like that. It's so simple, but that's what Allah is saying. Don't say that. And so we're telling our children, and you know, in popular society, that's not a thing. And so if you if you do allow your kids to watch cartoons or movies, you know, when it comes to one of those scenes where the kids are interacting, who pauses that and say, hey, hey that's wrong. I do that. Like I like I'll, 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 I I hear it. And I'm like, hold, hold on a second. Hold on. We're gonna we're gonna break that down. Like even if it's a cartoon, even if it's like something else, that what that little creature, you know, is doing towards his mom or dad. Dingo. What are those? The little, uh, you know, the dingo uh, Bluey. You know, I don't think I've heard any but uh, from Bluey um, or Peppa Pig. I don't think what else. Uh, but you know, I some of the older the older cartoons. You see Ukuk there, right? And some and it's and it's not always addressed. That's where it's dangerous because when it when when the uquq happens and uquq is not like it's not even the, the hitting or the cursing. It's those subtle things that we're 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 making sure that the fine we're refining their interaction. Look, there's there's certain things you do not you know you don't do with 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 parents, um, and so we're 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 calling those out. So as a parent, that's one area where you can teach them the rules. Of the uh, of the the rights of parents by when you see it in society or if you're in a store. Have you ever seen that in a store? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. I've seen people curse out their parents and you know hit their parents. I mean, it's just been. Absolutely. Sometimes I want to say something, but then you know, like, what's probably going to happen? What's the mom prob or the dad probably going to say? You're probably going to get yelled at. Yeah, don't talk to my son. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I translated this book like. <laughs> With you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of part of my my question. We live in a culture that accepts yeah. that kind of stuff as normal part of teenage rebellion, or it's just part of the in some cultures, right? Well, Western, like yeah, yeah. Here in, it, it's it's in the movies, it's in the TV yeah. shows, it's in the schools that this is kind of normalized that that's what a kid's supposed to do when they come yeah to yeah, especially the Disney stuff mm -hmm. yeah. And it's but commercials. It's, it's awful. Yeah. I mean, books. You, uh, that, that concept of like teenage adolescent angst and the breaking away. I mean, it's a normal. Like this is this is what I wanted to say. Like, it's normal to for dissent to exist mm -hmm. between anybody, right? And parents and children also. But teaching children how to dissent and express their opinions in a respectful manner. Like you said, in terms of the round table and being available to listen to mm -hmm. those things and open to listen to those things, versus um, versus leading to that discussion of you know rolling the eyes and slamming the doors and going to the room and not coming out and you know like all of those kind of things that behaviors that we might see. So, how do we then be those types of parents who are open? who can have that relationship, you know, yeah. in this type of world as well for us, because honestly, it's 
It's, it's hard. It's a constant struggle, right? It's a daily struggle. It's an hourly struggle to like, you know, they, they, they walk, like Muhammad Malud mentions in his book, he says, he says, he goes through the uquq of all of the limbs. That's a nice, like, like so what would be the uquq of the, uh, of with the eyes? Rolling the eyes, you know, closing, not looking at like, look at me. You know, like Hassan tells me, he's like, Baba, eyes on me, eyes on me. <laughs> he learns it as, I'm like, okay, you're, you're right, actually, you know, eyes on me. Um, and that is the sunnah, right? The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he spoke to a person, he never gave them their back. He would turn and be fully present with the person. Um, so the eyes, what's the uquq of the hands? I don't know. Exactly. Actually, I, have a, I think I have a picture of it in here too, like, because 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 uh, because people like the, the kids will say if you say uquq of the hands, they're like, oh, you punch them. Like, listen, that doesn't usually happen, but like, what's the uquq of the hands? It's like you know, throwing your hands up in the um, what uquq of the feet? Stomping. Stomping away, or uh, going to a place that your parents don't give you permission, you know, to to go, you know, so walking and just having their like building that consciousness about. Your whole body and uh, body awareness, like you can do things with your eyes. I don't. Some kids get it intuitively that this is like that social awareness and the social cues. Other kids don't. We just have to keep like reminding them that's wrong, you know. And you're going to see it out in society. And I don't care what, you know, Timmy does out there in the world, you know. Uh, <laughs> Timmy, yeah, Timmy's the twin that was raised in a different household. Um, uh, and, and I made a lot of the stories uh, fun fun for the kids and some I, I tried to bring a little bit of that into the book Actually, no, I don't have that. So this is what I was going to say if somebody is going to teach them There needs to be like a training for the for the for the and the person should have like should have kids themselves So it's not just about you know an Islamic studies teacher, you know teaches this to the kids like there's um, something to, to, to be said about that experience a friend of mine who's a teacher in the UK, <clears throat> he says he feels that people who teach the dean should be over 40. And I'm now that I'm over 40, I, I agree with that. I agree with that because there's a lot of zealousness that happens in the 20s, especially before you get married, especially before you have children. It's like, okay, you know, like there needs to be like, like the, in the Jewish tradition, they have like senior rabbis, junior rabbis. But in our tradition, person graduates madrasa or mahdara and like all of a sudden, all right, sheikh, you know, you're leading the community. No, that's, he's got one seat at the table. It's going to have some extra like decorations, you know, the half of the Quran, you get a nice seat, you know, sheikh. But the moms are going to have a seat and the dads, the dads are going to have a seat. Dads, there's actually like one, two, three, there's seats over here, dads. <laughs> Any other questions or comments or things you'd like to share? Maybe something that you heard that like, I'd like to share this with the, the group. I think my, I have a question. So, um, like, I think my question is, we were talking, we were talking about how, like, agreeing to disagree, but how do you do that in a respectful manner? They want to do something, and you want to be there for them, you want to hear them out, but you don't, you don't agree with it. Yeah. But they want to do what they want to do. So. You don't want them to be disrespectful, but then how you don't agree with them. Yeah. But they're gonna do it anyways. I don't know. How do you Yeah, yeah. So if I if I could if I could summarize like you tell them no, whatever, A B C, right? Like the A B C that you can't do that. Yeah. And you know they're going to do it. And you want to let them know, like, even though I know you're going to do it, I'm not going to put, uh, you know, because you could, you could pull out all, you know, pull out the heavy guns, metaphorically speaking, right? You could pull out the heavy guns and, like, stop them, right? You could do that. But you know as a parent, like, there's certain, there's certain things that you just, like, kind of, like, turn the other, um, turn a blind eye, think, right? We all do that as parents. We're just like, I'm going to choose my battles wisely. And one, some days I'm going to fight that battle, and some days I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, voice my protest and just like not let them, uh, know, uh, you know, know that um, that it's wrong. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to, to push uh, on that. Is that the, the the scenario? Yeah. Well, what's what's different? Like. No. I, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, pick your battles, right? Pick your battles, right? Yeah. So, is your question like, how do you pick the battles while yeah. maintaining like the uh, the 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 pledge? Mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Yeah, that's that's a difficult thing. And I think for me, my, my opinion is that it's more of an art than it is a science. Because you have to know like situational awareness in that situation. You know, especially if you have every child has a different demeanor and they're at different ages. And you know which one you can push a little bit more and which one you can't. 
Which is why sometimes, you know, you might have another parent say, why'd you let her do that? Right? Why'd you let him do that? Well, I know my son or I know my daughter. Uh, this is why um, it, it's really important, like to take it out of the, the, the family situation. Like, let's take it to Allahu Akbar. Take it to Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar, enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil. If somebody walks into the masjid, which, by the way, my father, Allah, in this masjid saw a shahada in this right here, up there uh, in that area, and the guy, the, the brother's first prayer, somebody came up while he's in praying and is fixing his feet. Okay, now if somebody, now maybe that ammo, you know, that we all have the zealous uh, khalas and the zealous ammos in every single masjid, right? They're the self-appointed Umar ibn al-Khattab for the masjid and they're going to go in there and fix it. And if, and if everybody just listened to that amma, the whole world would be a better place. That's the mindset. So the, if that person doesn't know this guy just became Muslim. And even if he didn't become Muslim, Ammo, that's not your job to do that. So what ha now let me take it out of the masjid. One of the things that ISIS did when in the areas that they controlled is the police force was never from the locality. It was never like in Syria, they would have they would have the Libyans that came, the Algerians that came, the Uzbekis that came, they would make them the police. Because what's going to happen in that village? If you had this now this new authoritarian regime that just took over and now they're going to lay down the law If they put local people as the police, that's one scenario And they put people who are coming in there with that zealous feral minds. Those guys look feral. Don't they look feral? They're just feral coming in there and they're like eh, Sharia, you know, you know everything um, um, Who's gonna have more rahmah with the local population? The local people because if they had a local person and they're like, okay, he just broke the law. Just hold on a second. This is Abu Ahmed. I know him. You know, all of that stuff. And that stuff is going to like balance out the harshness. And so you as a parent, you know your children. You know where you can push. You know where you can pull back. And you're doing that comprehensive holistic tarbiyah of them. And somebody from the outside doesn't have that. Sometimes you need that. You need a little bit of pushing. Right? You do need the coach figure in there that's just like, he's got to learn how to do that. She's got to learn how to do that. And you need to do that. But you're going to mitigate a little bit of that, you know, in, in the process. Um, so I know I kind of went off like into geopolitical stuff. And uh, as a very sad story, though, there was one guy. Um, what did they what did they do? Oh, th this was a horrible story. There was a person who was supposed to be executed and... What was it? He, they made the child come and walk, uh, come and do the execution of the parent. This is ISIS. So that's one of the main, like I have a, a lot, like Alhamdulillah, I've studied a lot of the Sharia. And so when I would hear this story, I'm like, oh, that's wrong. That's, you know, like when they're saying Sharia, 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 I'm like, no, no, I know the Sharia. That's not the Sharia. Um, one time, uh, well, so, so, you know, if, if you, in, in here in, in, uh, um, in, in, the, in the book, Muhammad Maulud says, he talks about taking your parents to a dispute in court. Like, there's ahkam about that. Like, if there's a dispute in court, and there's, there's special uh, things that are uh, special rules for when a child and a parent are in a court together, because now you have, you have the hukuk, of, of the child and you have the hap of the parent. How do you, how do you, uh, you know, uh, deal with that, balance that out. And so these guys just went off the, the deep end. And so they're like, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to show them we're so um, adherent to the Sharia. We will make the child do this execution. It's just like, that's completely against the, um, uh, against the Sharia. Um, so again, I know I went off all over the place, uh, but that's, that's the art of knowing where to push and where not to push. Two things <clears throat> that Sheikh Muhammad Maulud mentions, he said there's two, actually two levels of uquq. One is a saghira, one is a small, a lesser sin, and one is a kabira. The saghira is when the parent doesn't like that, but they don't get angry. And the kabira is when they do get angry. So now what we want to help our children understand, like, look, that's, that is a, the uquq is a sin. Like, and you have to, you have to be careful of that. Especially once you become mukallaf, you become responsible, you're going to be responsible for those sins. And I'm sure you all have heard stories or you've seen, you know, in the Muslim community, 
adult Muslim children who just have complete disres disrespect and disregard of their parents. So they are in a state of uquq. So we want to start like from the young age to make sure that they, they can understand there is this sin called uquq. And, and then as parents, we know there's two levels of it. So try your best not to get angry because you don't want to escalate that sin for the child from a saghira where you're like, you know, don't do ABC as opposed to like, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out my anger and now it becomes a, it becomes a kabira for, for the person. The other thing is, um, is, to, is, to, is to get into a habit of, of A, forgiving them for that, forgiving them for their uquq, while maintaining those boundaries so that we don't enable the behavior and we keep those healthy boundaries. And then two, to never make dua against your children. To never make your dua against your children. Uh, because <clears throat> one of the things they say is one of the dua al-mustajab, one of the accepted dua, you know, it's like at the Kaaba, it's accepted. Laylatul Qadr, it's accepted. You know, all of these times, the parent for the child. The parent for the child. So two things. Make, if you know you have accepted dua for your children, make dua for the best things. And if you make dua against them, you know it's mustajab. And I'll tell you a story that's, that's in here. It's a very powerful story about that. Um, in that regard, I just wanted to ask, there are not be making a dua against them. But you know that terrible feeling inside of you, thinking that why would he or she, how yeah. would he or she do this? And then you're trying to think about it, but to get to the point of saying, okay, I forgive him, or I forgive her. How, how do you deal with that time period that yeah. brings a terrible insight? Yeah, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, for instance, you're telling your kid to do something a certain way. You said it so many times, but it's not getting instilled in your children. And then at one point, you just have so much of it that you kind of lose it and, you know, you voice it a little bit more. And I, I feel like at that point, since I've asked so many times, I kind of lost it. But how do I go back to it so I can keep on doing it. Yeah. So I can instill that habit in a child. And if we could figure that out, wouldn't life be a lot easier? <laughs> I, I can see everybody just like, like I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. You're, you're, um, um, which is why, could you imagine if like, if, if I didn't have kids and I'm going to try, oh, well, let me, let me answer that for you, right? So there's an experiential knowledge that, that, that comes only through, through living life. Um, what, what I would say about that is, 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 is you have a right to become angry. You do have a right. And sometimes the message won't go through until you get angry. And so you're actually doing a service to your child every once in a while to like become visibly angry. Did the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with all of his forbearance and all of his gentleness and all of his acceptance, did he come become angry at times? And how would the Sahaba know he's angry? His face would turn red. They said like, like somebody poured pomegranate juice on it. Isn't that pretty angry? Now that's not all the time. So his, his main demeanor was patience, acceptance, forbearance, you know, and, and, and so forth. And another thing you would see, he would have more forbearance for the Bedouins than for the city Arabs. So that's also, you know, like understanding like, look, look, they were raised in the, in the wild, basically. You can understand that. And I've seen some of those people in the, I saw one kid in Mauritania, I got off on a, a truck, he ran away from me like he saw death. Because there was a part of Mauritania, they've never seen white people. <laughs> he ran away from me like he was like, he, and he was like on this donkey, like bareback, you know, and like, and like little kids, six years old, and he's like, you know, and then he's like, ah, he sees me and he just jumps off the, like, you know all those stories about the Native Americans and how they are on their horses? Oh, those Bedouin Arab kids on their donkeys? Wow. Like they, they, yeah, we should bring them to the rodeos here in the U.S. Um, my uncle trains horses for rodeos in Texas. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll be like, you know, Rami and the donkey rodeo, you know. And then, okay, so, um, but, um, so the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would be much more forbearing with the Bedouins than he would be with the city, because, the city people, because he was like, look, you're, 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 you're city people. You were not raised in, you didn't have their same experience. And so they would come in and they would grab his shirt like this. When one person says, one person grabbed his, uh, his no, that, actually that was a Jewish man. A Jewish man that he had loaned money to, that he, the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had borrowed money from him, and he, there was an appointed time to pay him back, 
And the Jewish man came before the time was up and he pulled, he grabbed his shirt like this until they said his neck was red. And he said, oh, you Benny Hashem, you always pay your debts late. So I'm here to collect my, my money. So he did a couple of things. He came early for his debt. He cursed Benny Hashem with this, uh, with this uh, rumor that was about them, like, oh, Benny Hashem, they're known for uh, paying their debts, uh, debts late. And he, he, so he insulted him, and he physically assaulted him by doing that. Omar's response, what do you think Omar said? He grabbed his sword, and he was basically like, let me make my sword his necklace. That's what he said. And so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Umar, it would have been better for you, like calm down, it would have been better for you to tell him to speak nicely to me and to remind me to pay my debts. Um, and so he paid, uh, you know, he paid the debt and then that per, the, the Jewish man said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said that was the, he knew all of the signs of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, but he also knew the sign and he needed to test it. He said, the more rude you are with him, the more he increases in his forbearance, in his hilm. And so I needed to test it. So he came there with three things. Came early for his debt, cursed his family, and, pull, and pulled his shirt. And then he, he became Muslim. So, um, so we, have, we, we try to maintain like that the average is the forbearance, but he would get angry. So you, you're, and you're a human being. We're, all, we're, we're human, we have emotions, and people can push us to our, our limits. And if we don't allow ourselves to feel that anger and to express that anger, we're, we're going to end up with a lot of resentment and frustration later on. And so the kids need to see that sometimes. The difficulty is that after it's, if it's all said and done, one of the things that they, they mention, at least modern research about, um, 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 uh, just when, when we correct, whether it's verbally or physically for those who choose it, we know the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never hit anybody, but for those who choose it, if they explain, look, I want you to be a better person. I'm do I get mad, you know, like after you get mad at them and you yell or you say something, you come and you say, I'm doing this because I love, not like, you know, like the, the trope is like, you know, they're hitting the person. I'm doing this because I love you. No, we're saying afterwards, once everything, everybody's calmed down, they got the message, is like, look, I may have gotten a little bit too angry. The reason is ABC, I want you to do this and, and explain. Um, and if we did transgress a boundary, that we let them know, look, I can, I can make a mistake. Um, and what I was sharing earlier about how your kids might love when they see your parents check you, when you can show them that the Sharia can check you, that like says, wow, I actually have something, like I have this power, like I can say the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you, 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 you know, you'll, you'll pull back. Or um, you tell, uh, I, I got angry. And this is why I was angry. I might have gotten a little too angry, and I know I yelled at you. I, I want to try not to raise my voice. I love you here. I hug you. All of those things. Um, and this is why this is why I got angry. So I know it doesn't answer your your question example uh, exa uh, exactly, um, but that's just some some of my thoughts. But you had two questions. One was about the anger. The forgiveness part. Okay, the forgiveness. And no, sorry, the dua part. Oh, the dua. Never make, uh, a dua against, against them. them. Yeah. But when you're upset at your children and then that weird feeling that you have, you want to say it that, you know, I forgive him but, or her, and that time lapse, that time between them eating you up because you want to say it. Yeah. But how do you help yourself to get yeah. there sooner than later? It's easier said than done, right? So, like, the forgiveness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, I, your question made me think of, a, a similar class like this, we were with um, a sheikh from Senegal, and so they said what they'll do when they have that towards the kids, the du'a will come out with anger and passion, but it'll be something like, yeah, yeah. Hey, you become the best mu'ad and have to call the adad in front of the kaaba. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You become, like, like you have it, so angry, you're, you're, you're so angry, you're so angry, like the words are, the best wishing, like, yeah, yeah. the best thing you could possibly do. I've seen that a lot in West Africa, yeah. <laughs> yes, <it's so> <laughs> Has anybody ever done that? You've done that, right? It's a good practice. I, I've seen it in Mauritania. In West Africa, there's a lot of traditions like that. And like, Allah yarda alik, you know, like, may Allah accept. And so they're getting the message, like, you know, I'm angry, but you're also like, you're not allowing yourself to get it because once you get in, you know, you're, you, you, you could lose like some of that, uh, the, the executive functioning and say something that you regret later, especially a dua. Um, there's one of the, one of the ulama, it's mentioned in the commentary of this, uh, he came to the sheikh and he was complaining about his son. 
And he, so the Shaykh is listening, you know, he said, uquq, uquq, uquq. he said, did you ever make dua against him? And the dad's like, yeah. He said, anta afsad tuhu. You're the one who messed him up. You're complaining to me about his actions of uquq. You made the dua. Like if he says, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, yakhrab, whatever, you know, like that's like, may you be just, you're just turned into rubble or whatever like well yakhrib means you're deen too right or like you know uh, I, I hope i hope you never whatever um i read this um i read this online and then i went to a museum any anybody ever been to the henry ford museum in michigan yeah it's beautiful beautiful museum uh and he built it as an educational facility from experience like you know so um um he, uh, they had a Titanic exhibit. So what they had was a, a suitcase for, of this young 14 year old kid. He was, he was upset that he was on the, on the Titanic and he, he wrote in his journal, I hate this ship. I wish it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. So we have to really, really be careful of the dua that we make. One of the stories that's mentioned uh, of Juraj. Juraj was a man who, he was a Abid. The Prophet wasallam said Juraj was from Bani Israel and he was in his monastery uh, and he was always in worship. Mm -hmm. And one day his mom came and she called out to him and he was in prayer and she said, Ya Juraj, oh Juraj, where are you? And he said in the prayer, Ya, uh, 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 ya Rabbi Ummi wa Salati. You know, my mom or my prayer. And so then he finished his prayer. The next day she came back, Ya Juraj, you know, he's like, Ya Rabbi Ummi wa Salati. And so he continued in his prayer. He, he had a choice, respond to my mom, continue my prayer. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if Juraj, because he was an Abid, he was a worshiper. If he was a Faqih, if he knew the Fiqh rulings, he would have known to answer his mom. And so when she, when she did, and she knows he's in the monastery. And she's calling out to him, he's not responding. So she's, she makes a dua against him. Well, that dua came true. And so the people destroyed his monastery. They slandered his name. You know, all of this stuff happened. Um, and eventually there was a miracle that, that, that occurred. Um, but in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the, the lesson, the main lesson people get is respond to your parents. But the other lesson is, Jorej's mom made that dua against him. And it came true. So we, we, we should be uh, very careful um, about that. Any other final questions? I know we wanted to end right at 8.30. Before we go ahead and wrap up. Okay. All right. Well, the, uh, so, so what I will say is, alhamdulillah, we brought, I had these books. It's in your risk. Um, and the only thing I would ask is that you also take one of these um, flyers about Taiba and just learn a little bit about what we do. And if you do feel so inclined, sign up for the newsletter. Just put in your email to, to get some of our updates. But you're welcome to um, to take each one of those. They're just literally, they're not hot off the press, but they're essentially hot off the press. Okay. Assalamu alaikum.